Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. You know, I'm sure this is definitely a an encouragement, a story for someone that may be facing something so heavy, so deep. And we've all experienced storms. We've all experienced the waves of life. And, and to see Ruben here today in Lourdes, would you guys just wave and say hi real quick? Isn't that amazing? And their kids, they're somewhere around here, I'm sure. Next service, kids. I love it. I love it. You know what's interesting is that I didn't even know this family. And when, they, when the daughters came to Elevate Church, and, and one thing that, because um, I, I wondered, how did they find out? It's, you know, gossip goes around. Gossip that God does miracles, gossip that God heals, gossip that God restores, good gossip. And I guess they heard that miracles happen at Elevate Church. And that's, he's not the first story. We've had many stories like Reuben. And, uh, and they came here and they were asking and seeking and they were just, you know, wanting to see God do a miracle. And the whole church came together and we all prayed and we all believed and God did a tremendous miracle beyond just going to the hospital and praying with them. Because obviously I can't do that for everybody, but when God speaks, we move. And what, one thing I want to hit today is we have to realize that in this life, you are going to hit waves, you're going to hit winds, you're going to hit storms. And if you're sitting here today and thinking, well, I'm so glad he ain't talking to me today. Well, guess what? I'm preparing you for one. Because you're going to be in one. If, if you are breathing, you are an opportunist for a storm to hit your life. Whether it's the storm of finances, storm of health, storm of marriage, storm of children, storm of addiction. I don't know what you may be facing today, but there is hope for every single one of us. And I know this truth because I know that we all have the tendency in this voyage to drift away. I mean, just think about the ocean, the sea. You know, it, it literally causes big ships to drift. And I'm here to tell you today that there's going to be times in your life where you're going to drift from your faith. There's going to be times in your life you're going to drift from your family. You could drift from your purpose. You can drift from the truth, not a truth, but the truth. And we see that more and more just in, in, in Christianity today. We're, we're, we're literally drifting away from God's truth. We, 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 we live off of our opinion, but don't live off of God's truth. And then we wonder why we drift from the truth, the way, and the life who's Jesus. And so all of us here can drift at any moment of our life. It doesn't matter how old you are. Man, the drift is an opportunist. It works on every age, whether you're a teenager, whether you're a young adult, whether you're someone in your 40s, 50s. But let me tell you something, even at the age of 80, you can drift from God. You can drift from church where you're just kind of on and off. You come, then you drift. You come, then you drift. All of us are an opportunist for drifting. But how many know that God always has a way to get you back? Huh? Every single one of us, we can drift. And the winds come, the waves come, and when you have a strong relationship with Jesus, let me tell you something, you have the power to overcome. Now, I love to fish. I really enjoy fishing. I like going out to sea. I like to fish. My problem is, is that I don't do good on boats. I get seasick all the time. I do dream. I mean, I've done it all. Every possible thing that they say, do this, do that. I've done them all, and I still, I get like nauseous and dizzy and I just want to throw up and I'm just thinking okay well the throw up will be the chum then I don't know but I'm a fish and you know what happens is 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 my passion for fishing trumps my seasickness and I'm telling you right now when you're going through something when you are intentionally connected with God the Father, when you know God the Son, when you understand that God the Holy Spirit lives in you, that passion will trump whatever storm you face in life. It's when you don't know God like that that you completely begin to sink. But you're not too far that God can reach you today. You're not too far. So I want to I wanna give you my first point. I'm a points guy. If you uh, like taking notes, download our church app. I have all my message points there. But the first point I want to share with you is I believe that God says 
don't lose sight of the shore in the storm. Don't lose sight of the shore in the storm. I know we've all heard this or said this before. You know what? I can't even see the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, guess what? I'm telling you right now that Jesus showed us the perfect example. He's on the cross. He's suffering. He's in pain. He feels forgotten. He even said, it, Father, why have you forsaken me? But let me tell you what kept him. Let me tell you what enabled Jesus. He said, for it was the joy that was set before me that I endured the cross. You know what that joy was? Look at your neighbor and say, it was you. And so the problem that we have in, in, our, in our walk with God is that so many times we focus on what we're going through and we forget to focus on where we're headed to. Stop focusing on what you're going through and start setting your eyes on the shore of hope, the shore of victory, the shore of redemption. Because when you stay focused solely on what you don't have or what you're not, I'm telling you, you just begin to sink. You start losing confidence. You lose, you lose that, 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 that faith and that trust that God is your anchor in any storm. And I want to get us to get that back in the next three weeks. Is that okay? And so uh, here's another point. You are the captain of your ship, but God gives the destination. All right, so don't act like you're all that in a bag of tortillas, okay? You're not all that, okay? You're the captain of your ship, okay? You are the captain of your ship, but God gives the final destination. And so what does that mean to me? That means that God leaves me with the responsibility to get to the destination that he's already predestined for my life, my family, my children, and my job as the captain is to lead my family. I love the story of Reuben and Lourdes and their family because when that captain was down, let me tell you something, thank God he trained his crew how to keep the ship together. Yeah, come on, give the Lord a hand clap. And you know what that tells me too? That means that there's moments in your life, like my life, just like you guys, okay, I'm vulnerable. I'm being honest with you. There's moments where I ain't feeling it. I'm not feeling victorious. I don't feel like, man, we're progressing. I, don't, I got all kinds of feelings, just like you. We're human. Yes, we're pastors, but stop putting us on a pedestal. We're just like you. We cry like you. We suffer like you. We worry like you. We're crazy like you. <laughs> but when I'm down, my wife's up. When she's down, I'm up. And we have to make sure that we, as the crew, especially you parents, make sure that you're training your children. Listen, God, God lent you your kids. They're not yours. They're on loan to you. It is your responsibility to train them up how to be captain when you can't lead it. You have to teach them how to trust God, how to embrace God. When I was going through that whole cancer experience I went through 12, 13 years ago, let me tell you something. I could still remember being on that sick bed. I remember my little kids jumping up on the bed of the hospital room, and they would begin to lay hands on me and pray for me and rebuking the devil, literally. Let me, that's the word. It's authority. I've seen many miracles. That's why you can't even convince me that God's not a miracle-working God. I don't care who you are. I don't care how contemporary you are. I don't care how well put together you are. I have faith in Jesus. When you get to heaven, what are you going to tell God? I couldn't believe, you know, I struggled with it all your life. Are you kidding me? There's a season of that, okay? Just like there's, there's the four seasons, right? There's the four, there's the four seasons of California. We love our four seasons. God bless California. We're awesome. Well, guess what? Storms also have seasons. And you, know how to, you need to know how to weather that season, but you got to train your kids how to weather it with you. Because when you, mom and dad, when you're down, you better pray that your kids have enough word in them to get you back up. That was free 99 right there. Keep it. Say it, I'm the captain of my ship, but God gives the destination, all right? He's the boss, so don't, 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 don't act like you're all that, okay? Okay, here's this. Let me give you captain. Let me give you a quick definition, my own definition. Captain of your ship can be defined as this, directing the thoughts. Where does the, where does the battle start? The mind, the thoughts, that's where the battle starts. You start thinking you're not good enough, you're worthless, we're not coming out of this. I can't get out of this. It's just, I just don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, right? And so... Uh, it starts in the thought life. It's always going to start. In the, it starts in the thought life. It ends in the thought life. So, so it means 
uh, directing the thoughts, directing the plans, and directing the actions of your life, and sometimes others. And that's what this family did. They ha- he, he was out for the count. And then family had to step in and say, okay, now I got to start directing this. So great job, Lourdes. Great job. Awesome. And so I want you to know today that when you look at testimonies like that, these are testimonies that are available to all of us. And, and, and we can all walk in this same power and authority that Jesus, if you read your Bible, okay, Jesus says, I give you my authority. I give you all authority. In other words, God's saying, I'm just looking for some believers that can really believe me that this isn't just something I did 2,000 years ago, but that I am the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And so if God did it for Reuben, God will do it for you. And the measure of pain you're in, God doesn't measure or, you know, you're worse, so let me help out the worst guy because, you know, you can get over yourself. No, God cares about even the hangnail that you're probably going through right now, the hangnail of life, the hangnail of marriage. And how many know that hangnails hurt? And us men, we're weak. Aren't we? He's like, ah, what's wrong with you? Oh, my finger. You know? So God cares about that. He cares about everything. Aren't you glad that God cares about us? All right, let me tell you a quick story, and then let's get out of here. I'm going to give you a few points. So let me paint the picture. So here you have the Apostle Paul, greatest apostle that ever lived, disciple of Jesus Christ. And this man was a theologian. I mean, this guy can break down God's word like nobody's business. And so Paul is now being arrested for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as he's arrested, he is being condemned to go to see Caesar in Rome. And he is about to board a ship. And as he boards this ship to go on this voyage, God already had a destination for him. Paul just didn't know what it was going to look like until he was finally on the ship. And so let's start in Acts chapter 27, verse 10 through 44. And I want you to look on the screens or on the app. It says, verse 10, men, he said. So he's talking to the people before they get going on this voyage. He says, I can see that our, that our trip is going to be dangerous. Dang. Right away, he's just already like, I, I can see this is not going to be good. Wouldn't it be awesome if we just accepted that life is dangerous? Like, you know what? People always get weird with me. Please don't be that person. Like, I ride motorcycles, and people are like, oh, my God, you ride motorcycles. I'm like, calm down. Pray for me. Gosh, stop putting fear in me, man. Like, what if they hit you? Oh, my God, what if they run you over? What if, uh, uh, I'm like, relax. Hey, listen, yesterday I had a time. I'm like, you can literally walk out of your house, man, and, and a bee bites you. And let's say you're allergic to bees, you die. Life is dangerous. You got in your car. That's dangerous. Life is dangerous. Okay, so don't trip. As you go through this voyage, as you go through this journey, as you take risks for God, life is dangerous. So uh, Paul's like, hey, listen, uh, but he was talking about a bad danger. He's like, this is going to be bad. The ship and everything in it will be lost. Our own lives will be in danger also. But the commander didn't listen to what Paul said. Isn't that interesting? Does that sound familiar? Try to give someone advice. They don't listen to you. I know a lot of those. Instead, he followed the advice of the pilot and the ship's owner. Hey, let me tell you something. We need to start learning how to take counsel from God's word. Isn't it amazing how we'll go ask 10 people before we get before God and see what God has to say about it? Like, we'll go get everybody's opinion, especially people that don't even love God, know God, and you start getting counsel. Not that they can't give you good counsel, but I think that the first counsel that we should seek is God's word. What does God have to say about it? Now, now what, what does everybody think about this situation? What does God say about this situation? Because I promise you right now, whatever you're facing, God already has an answer for that. But you've got to do your due diligence, and you've got to look. And he says in verse 13, a gentle south wind began to blow. And the ship's crew thought they saw their chance to leave safely. So they pulled up the anchor, and they sailed along the shore of Crete. And before every, uh, very long, a wind blew down from the island. It hit Uh, It had the force of a hurricane. Now, check this out. It was called Northeaster. At least that's a cooler name than the names we have, huh? Katrina, Hugo. Got all kinds of weird names. And the ship was caught by the storm. And we cannot keep sailing into the wind, so we gave up. So we what? Gave up. And isn't that what happens when we hit a storm? The first thing we want to do is we want to give up. 
Why? There's no effort in giving up. It's easier to quit than to fight. It's easier just to say, you know what? <sighs> He's never going to change. Ah, she's never going to change. Don't look at him right now, okay? <laughs> it's true. It's so much easier to do that. But look at this, verse 15, 16, sorry. He says, we passed the calmer side of a small island called uh, Kauda. We almost lost the lifeboat. So now, they're, man, they're in a hurricane, guys. Listen, get the picture, okay? They're on the ship. They're on the boat. Man, this thing is like, <laughs> waves are hitting. They almost lost the lifeboat. That was tied to the side of the ship. So the men lifted the lifeboat on board. Then they tied ropes under the ship um, itself to hold it together. They were afraid it would get stuck on the sandbars of uh, Sitters. So they lowered the sea anchor and let the, si the ship be driven along. We took a very bad beating. Ever say that? We took a very bad beating. And in this life, you're going to take some bad beatings. And the reason I want to just throw that out there is because I'm going to give you some, some ways of, of overcoming the bad beatings of life. From the storm, we took some bad beatings from the storm. So the next day, the crew began to throw the ship's contents overboard. On the third day, they even threw the ship's tools and supplies overboard with their own hands. With their, their, their what? Their own hands. Their own hands. I'm going to have a point for that. Verse 20, and the sun and stars didn't appear for many days, and the storm was terrible. So we gave up all hope of being saved. And then the men had not eaten for a long time, and Paul stood up in front of them. Men, he said, you should have taken my advice. There's the sandwich, right, of encouragement. Men, you should have listened to me. You should have paid attention. I warned you. I told you that she was no good for you. I told you he was going to lie to you. I told told you that business partner was going to jack you up. I told you. I told you. I told you. I told you. Have you ever done that to somebody? Yeah, I do that here all the time. Um, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have, then look at this, then you would have avoided this harm and this loss. It's so important. Guys, please learn how to be submitted to godly counsel. Learn, train yourself. Don't act like you're all that and you know it all and, and I got this. No, that's pride. And pride comes before the great what? Fall. It comes before the great sink. And so sometimes we have to just take a step back and you have to accept what you're listening to because people, and hopefully you have the right they, the right they should be the ones that are bringing you closer to Jesus, not agreeing with you especially when you're wrong and you're off. If you got people around you that are telling you what you want to hear instead of what you need to hear, you need to go ahead and get away from those kind of people. Thank you. Those <laughs> good advice, huh? Would you please take that advice? Good. Not one of you will die, but it takes, listen, it takes one person in the family to say, you know what, we're not going down. That's what that tells me. Like, it can be so bad, and it just takes one person. Like this whole thing can be falling apart and it just takes one individual to say, you know what? I know we're going down, but we're not going down. It looks like we're going down, but we're not going down. We're going to overcome. And so what is he doing? He's trying to stir them up. He says that not one of you will die. Only the ship will be destroyed. Isn't that good news, huh? I belong to God and serve him. I belong to God. Ever say that. I belong to God. You know what? I think many of us here, you need to know that you belong to God. You don't belong to you. She doesn't belong to you. He doesn't belong to you. No, you belong to God. Paul was being very vocal about whose he was. When you're in a storm and you know who you belong, then you know that God's cargo has to get to its destination. Seriously, when you know. So you, you, how do I know that I belong to God? Well, here's how, we, here's how you know. He says, he says, I belong to God and I serve him. That's how you know you belong to him. And I say this because there's so many Christians out there that have an idea of belonging to God, but don't really know they belong to God. Why? Because they just don't have this intimate personal relationship that serves God. Because once you serve God, you really honestly know God because of your actions. Your actions speak louder than your words. I know God, but you don't serve him. You want to know God? Serve him. Serve him. That's a whole other, and I always say this at church, if you don't serve, you swerve. It's true. Yeah, the moment you stop focusing on God, you swerve. You start, you drift. 
It's, it's, it's the reality. It's the truth. And so he says, so the angel said to me, look at this. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must go on trial in front of Caesar. Don't trip, Paul. Listen, I know it looks bad right now, but God still has a destination for you. You have to make it to Caesar. And he says, and the angel said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must go in front of Caesar. God has, has shown his grace by sparing the lives of all those sailing with you. Men, continue to be brave. I have faith in God. It will happen just as he told me, but we must run the ship onto the beach of some island. And they were afraid. They were afraid that we would crash against the rocks, so they dropped four anchors. How many anchors? Don't forget that, because I'm going to give you four anchors of ship. They dropped four anchors from the back of the ship, and they prayed. So they not only dropped it, they prayed. It's, it's, it's not just pray and wait. No, it's do something while you're praying. Amen. Verse 33, and just before dawn, Paul tried to get them all to get to eat for the last 14 days. He said, you guys have kind of just been wandering around worried and, and stressed what's going to happen, etc. And he says this, you have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I'm asking you to eat some food. You need it to live. Not one of you will lose a single hair from your head. And after Paul said this, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God. Sounds like he took communion right there on the spot. You know what you do when you're in a storm? You take communion. You know what you do in a storm? You worship God. You praise God in the storm. You don't praise God when it all is well. Like right now, maybe some of you, you're, you're just, you're, you're peachy king. It's all good. Man, everything's money's coming in. House, you know, mortgage is paid for. You know, job is secure. You know, family's doing great. Kids aren't going cray cray. Everything's good. But here's the deal. We have to come to that place where we have to look at everything and say, okay, but I have to prepare for a storm like this. But I love how he says it because he says he took bread and he gave thanks. Not You don't just give thanks to God when you're good. You give God thanks when it's bad and he says and he did this where they all could see him and they broke it and began to eat and all of them were filled with all kinds of grub is that what it says what were they filled with so listen you as a believer your job my job as the captain of my ship as the captain of your ship is not just to feed people to be a provider dad you're not just a provider physically you're a spiritual provider where you are actually providing hope for your children notice it didn't say and they were filled to full no it says and they were filled with hope that's what happened with reuben and his family we came and we fed them with hope again and so they ate some food. Now, I'm almost done. There were 276 of us on board. Can you imagine that back in those days? 276 people on the crew. Wow. Well, a lot of them were prisoners, but, I mean, that's a lot of people. And they ate as much as they wanted. Look at this, verse 41. But the ship hit a sandbar. So the front of the, it got stuck and wouldn't move. And the back of the ship was broken to pieces by the pounding of the waves. And I don't know if you're broken to pieces in your heart, but God knows how to fix that. The, listen, the soldiers planned to kill the prisoners. They wanted to keep them from swimming away and escaping. But the commander or the captain wanted to save Paul's life because he had favor with the captain, with the commander. So he kept the soldiers from carrying out their plan. And he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and swim to land. The rest were supposed to get there on boards or other pieces of the ship that is how everyone reached land safely listen if you're going to survive a storm you're going to have to be anchored to God and pray if you're going to survive a storm you're going to have to be anchored and pray here's what happened this last week and you probably read it in the news but there was this this these teens in, in Af not in Africa but in Florida and they were swimming out in the ocean and you know what they were they're athletic they're they're swimmers they 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 do this all the time but see some of us can be so comfortable with our christianity we're like i got this i do this i do church it doesn't matter how much you do what happened the water the waves 
it started drifting them away from shore. It's so easy for you to be at the shore of God and then be drifted away out to sea. And these guys didn't, didn't pay attention. So you know what they said? They said, oh, we got this. We're just going to, because they're swimmers. So they said, okay, we, we know our, our destination. We see our point. We're just going to start swimming that way. And the more they tried to swim closer to this, 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 this island or this part of the beach in, in Florida, the further they got. And they kept struggling and struggling and struggling and struggling. And then what happened? Then they started having cramps in their legs. And when you're cramps, listen, when you start with cramps in your legs out in the ocean, I, I love the ocean, and you, you scuba dive all the time. And so it, it's, it's some serious business, okay? And so the first thing they did, or the second thing they did, after they kept doing it their way, they decided we got to pray to God. And they started praying, God, save us. Would you rescue us? And they just pleaded and pleaded and pleaded with God. And you know what happens next? As soon as they're done with their prayer, there's this yacht that comes, and the name of the yacht is Amen. <laughs> Come on, give God. That's not, this isn't a funny story. This is the reality. This is last week. And right now, listen, and these people that were on the yacht, let me tell you something. Here's the beauty about God. God was already sending a boat before they were ever in trouble. God is already sending your help before he ever knew that you would be in trouble. God has your back. Don't forget it. Give the Lord a better, better hand clap than that. That is awesome. Are you kidding me? And the yacht is called amen. You know what the word amen means? Let me show you what amen means. Amen means it is so or so it be. So when you pray, don't underestimate how you pray because the moment you say amen you're not only agreeing with you you're agreeing with heaven and heaven will move on your behalf that is so good i love that so when you pray you got to believe it you got to know it it is so all right the apostle paul had four anchors on his ship quickly mamalos ship s-h-i-p ready the s stands for stop the h stands for hear the I stands for identify, and the P stands for persevere. And every week, I'm going to change the acronym. We already did. I have acronyms for each one of them every week as I, you know, lay out this message. So, so let's start with stop. If you want to see great breakthroughs, if you want to see great victories, if you want to see miracles in your family life, you have to stop and turn around. What do I mean by that? Right now, you know that you are heading into the wrong direction, and you know it. You know that you're not close with God. You know that you're not right with God. You know that you're not as kind as you should be. You know that you're not paying attention. You know that you're not focused. You know that you keep making excuses. So what do you have to do? you got to stop and turn around. Verse number 10 says this. Paul said, men, he said, I can see that our trip is going to be dangerous. The ship and everything in it will be lost. Our own lives will be in danger also. We have to stop the doubts. Why? Because the doubts is what keeps you from ever getting closer to God. What do you do? You start doubting whether or not God, God, God is real, whether or not God is. Like Johnny, he, he received Christ on Easter Sunday. You know, this kid's an atheist. You know, man, he looks, I thought he was like 24, 20, 17 years old. Like, what in the world? He's so smart too. He talks like an older man. I'm just like, wow, it's such an old soul. But I love the fact, I love it when atheists come to our church. We get a lot of them here. And they allow them to get saved in our church. You know why? Because I used to be one of them. And I already understand what you go through. I know the doubts that you, that you face, but you got to stop it. At some point, you just got to stop and say, okay, God, help me. Help me. I don't understand. Help my unbelief. And so stop it. You got to stop the winds of fear. You got to stop allowing the enemy from keeping you into God's destiny. You have to embrace the word of God. Here's what Psalm said. Psalm says that the word is a lamp to your feet and it's a light to your path. We have to get back to God's word, guys. So stop it. How do I turn around? God's word. God's, listen, you don't read God's word. God's word reads you when you read it. I'm telling you right now. I'm reading his word. No, he's reading you today. You know what he does? When you read it, you start feeling conviction, not condemnation. You start like, ugh, you mean I got to be nice to my wife? Ugh. Right? You start, you start thinking things like that, like, ugh. And, and, and God will speak to you. He'll convict you. And, and, and then what's, listen, what's repentance? Turn from where you've been going and come back. Okay, number two. Um, 
Number two is, uh, da, 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 da. hear God, right? H, hear God. So let me tell you something. You got to know how to hear God. Why? Because God has given us the faith we need to get to the other side. You got to learn how to hear God. So verse 23, he said this. And 24, he says, last night an angel stood beside me and the angel said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must go to trial in front of Caesar. So what am I saying? I'm saying, that, I'm saying this to you. God speaks in many ways. He'll speak to you as you're reading your Bible. He'll speak to you as you're hearing me preach the gospel here. He'll speak to you during worship. God, it didn't have to be these long you know, words from heaven. It can be as simple as, Mauricio, I love you. Or it can be like Reuben. That night, Reuben, you know what God told me? God simply told me when your daughters came here and your son, God said, Mauricio, go. And it was late at night. I think I met you guys at the hospital at midnight. It was crazy late or 11 or something. I forgot what time it was. It was late. I was tired. I worked all day. We had services. But when God speaks, you go. When God says, get up, you get up. When God says you give, you give. When God says you forgive, you forgive. When God says you love, you love. When God says get up and serve, you serve. When God says take that job, you take that job. You don't waste time. You do. And you watch what God will do. Okay, the other one, I. Identify the baggage. You know what? We, we are so many times in a storm with baggage that we brought on that is literally sinking us. Look at this. Verse 18 says, we took a very bad beating from the storm. What do you do when you're taking a bad beating of life? Examine yourself. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. How am I doing? How's my faith? How, how's my walk? Uh, how's my, 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 my financial spending? Am I robbing God? Oh, I don't like hearing that one, huh? Got people got a little, like, whoa. Yeah, you got to ask yourself. Examine yourself. He says, they took a bad beating from the storm the next day the crew look at this who 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 did what the next day the crew everybody say the crew and say god came and unloaded their boat that's how many so many of us live that way god would you take this away from me god's like no you 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 deal with it come on i'll help you let's keep talking you'll you'll, you'll see what i mean by that and so the crew began to throw the ship's contents overboard and on the third day they even threw the ship's tools and the supplies overboard with their own hands listen what things or what relationships are you hooked up with linked up with that is dragging you down right now that can be a someone you're dating just sucking the life out of you that can be someone that is is always negative but you're like but the lord called me to love yeah he called you to love them but he didn't call you to just sit there listen who you hang with is who you become so watch who you're talking with who do you need to hey listen if they can throw jonah overboard you can throw some people overboard too jonah was a christian some christians need to be thrown overboard i love you man but from over there You're so mean. You know, you've. it's funny how whenever we're in church, we want to be so, uh, but at work, you already act like that. Let's be honest. We're so religious, aren't we? I just can't. I just, I don't like that. What lies are sinking your life right now? What drama is zapping your strength right now? Hey, I'll even say it this way. Maybe you're the drama. Maybe you need to throw yourself off board. Well, what do you mean by that? It means you've got to die to yourself, die to your pride, die to your ego. Stop trying to be right and just say, okay, you know what? I, I, I'm done with this ship. <laughs> what do you need to throw overboard? What unforgiveness do you need to throw overboard? What bitterness do you need to throw overboard? What fear do you need to throw overboard? What lie? What doubt? What do you need to throw overboard? Because I'm telling you, if you don't throw it overboard, it'll hold you down. Let me give you just real quick, we're done. Three things that constantly come to weigh me down. I'm going to be very, very vulnerable with you. These are the three things that, and I'm sure you're going to relate, many of you are going to relate to this, but these are the three that hit me all the time. Because I'm like that guy that throws things overboard. I like, I do this every week, but then I kind of, then I go for the dive, you know what I'm saying? And then I grab the scuba gear, extra oxygen to go make sure to pick it up off to the sea ground. And then I bring it back on board. 
And so it's like a constant thing. Have you ever done that? You pray to God and you're releasing something and you walk out and you're just like, <sighs> then you come back to church next Sunday and you pick it back up. That's, how, that's what happens to all of us. So I know that sometimes there's boatloads of stuff that we're not willing to throw overboard. My first issue that I deal with personally is insufficiency. That's something that hits me a lot. Insufficient is when you start saying, I'm not enough. I'm not talented enough. Uh, I don't have enough education. I don't have enough money. And how many know that God is so strategic because he says, when you are insufficient, God says, I'm all sufficiency. I don't know. Do you deal with that? Because I do. It's never enough. Like, just one of the issues I have, I like excellence, but sometimes perfection gets in my way. When you come to this service, man, we put on the best service that we can possibly put on. Why? Because we serve an excellent God. Excellent is, is his name. I don't care where we're at just because we're in New Hall or what people say about New Hall. I don't give a rip, but we're going to be excellent. We're going to be awesome for God. But there's times I feel like, man, it's not good enough, and that's insufficiency. And that, that, that just jacks me up sometimes, and I have to throw that overboard, on, especially on Monday. Here's the big one. Insecurity. Let me see all my insecure people. Let throw your hands in. No, no, don't do that. I'm just playing around. Eh, eh. Insecurity. That's something. Listen, I get the Monday blues. I try not, I try to work on it, but I'm gonna be honest with you. Monday I felt like my sermon sucked. I do. I'm like, man, you're dumb, Odis. You, you, did, you didn't have enough. You just didn't bring it. Like I get hit with those things. And I have to I have to like ah oh, get rid of that thought, that thought. Why? What am I doing? I have to stop letting my thoughts drift me from God's truth. And I have to realize that, no, what I gave was sufficient. What I gave came from my heart. And if, if that's all I have for this moment, thank God there's room for growth. Thank God there's room for improvement. But I constantly get hit with insecurity. The last one is insignificance. That's a big one for me because my wife and I, we love to serve. We love to serve uh, not just our city, which we do well. We love to serve the world. But I feel, and we, we, we want to rescue kids from sex trafficking, uh, from labor trafficking, from organ trafficking. Like, we want to rescue kids, and we're doing the best that we can. I mean, we built a school, opened a school. We have kids that are in our school in one of the poorest states in the entire country of Mexico, Oaxaca, Mexico. It's, it's the place where a train called the Beast comes through, and it's so big on especially Oaxaca is the biggest uh, state uh, in, in when it comes to organ trafficking, the organs of children. And you know who buys them? The world. China, Japan, USA. I ain't trying to hate on them. I love my country, but there's, we're so broken to pieces, aren't we? So insignificance. And so those are my three. But God gives me the choice to unload, just like God gives you the choice to unload it every day. That's your choice. God's not going to do it for you. He'll help you, but you have to do it. You got to do that. That's your choice. Last one, persevere. Persevere with hope. You got to persevere, church. Guys, persevere. I don't like what I'm going through yet. Neither does the next person sitting next to you. They don't like it either. But you got to persevere. Paul said, verse 35, after Paul said this, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God. And he did this where they all could see him. And then he broke it and he began to eat it. And uh, all of them were filled with hope. Listen, we don't worship and praise God when it's all good. The question is, can you worship in the midst of a storm? Can you do that? If you can do that, you're coming out. If you can't do that, you're sinking. All right, so God loves you. You need to take courage in the storm, guys. You've got to take courage. Take courage. Take courage. Take courage. Be brave. Be brave. Yeah, I don't feel brave. Well, listen, don't, don't, don't be led by your feelings. Be led by faith, and then your feelings will catch up. Stop, stop being feeling-led and start being spirit-led, and you watch where God will take you. we got too many feely Christians in the body of Christ. We've got to stop that noise, and I love it. There's a lesson in the storm. I know you don't like hearing that. There's a lesson in the storm, Ruben, right? But there's also a shore. You may be on lesson time. You know what I learned through cancer? 
compassion. I learned compassion. I got interviewed after because my, my whole thing was only, there's only been uh, two dozen people that have experienced this. As a matter of fact, two weeks before I arrived to the hospital, a doctor, a surgeon died of the same thing I had. Two weeks before. And when I was interviewed and asked, because it was so crazy, ridiculous, miraculous what happened. They even called me in the hospital, the miracle man, and they made me the, uh, the, the hospital, uh, um, what's the word? Chaplain. I was for five years. They gave me this badge, and I had access to intensive care, critical care, and NICU, infants, because they saw the miracle man is what they called me. And, 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 but let me tell you what. What I learned through it was compassion for sick people. That's why when God tells me go, I go. Why? Because that's my lesson. What's your life lesson? What are you learning from your stuff? You've been through trauma? Trauma? What's the lesson God's wanting to, to use? See, God will never waste a shipwreck. Maybe you've wrecked your marriage. God can rescue you. Maybe you've wrecked your business. God can help you. Maybe you've wrecked your parenting skills. God can redeem that. Maybe you've wrecked your own personal life. Maybe you're addicted to stuff, drugs, alcohol. I don't know what you guys are. I don't know you guys. But let me tell you something. God knows how to rescue people who have been shipwrecked. Amen. Listen, God can use your shipwreck, but don't get wrecked. Don't let that be your vice to say, okay, well, God will rescue me from this one. God won't waste it. Let me close this. All right, here's the cool part. Close your Bibles, let's get out of here. Here's the cool part. Wanna hear something really cool? So being that I was an atheist, I used to, like I've studied just about every religion. And I do that on purpose because I, I like to, all right, come talk to me, you know? So some scientists, um, they read the story, the same one I read to you guys today. And uh, they wanted to, to disqualify Acts chapter 27. And so a bunch of guys, they raised money. You know what they did? They're like, we're going to go to the crime scene. Kind of like when there's a murder, right? There's always going to be evidence. That's what I love about God. God left evidence on earth. Not only the Bible, he left evidence on earth. And so they're like, we're going to disqualify this thing. And we're going to do a whole show on how this wasn't true and blah, 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 whatever, right? So they, they go to uh, the island that's called Malta. And so when Paul landed in Malta, Nobody there believed in Jesus. No one had ever heard about Jesus. As a matter of fact, they had other gods. So Jesus uh, used Paul in great ways. So anyways, so these guys are saying, we're going to disqualify this story about the shipwreck, the Paul, whatever. So they go there, and they're getting their scuba gear ready and everything. They're going to go to the exact spot where the They literally started reading the Bible. To get all their evidence. Like, okay, let's see this. Uh-huh. Okay, let's go. And they literally took the map of the Bible. The map, literally, the destination of the Bible. And they went to that location. But before they went there, before they went under, they didn't know. And neither did the other guy who actually went down before them who wasn't looking for anything. He just thought he was looking for cool stuff. He goes underwater, and this guy was just a fisherman. He finds the four anchors. The four anchors are brought to a museum. These guys didn't know that four anchors were already found. They go to the museum and they are flipping, tripping out. Here's the other awesome thing. How God does not waste a shipwreck. Because his journey was to be in Rome, not Malta. Today, we know that Europe has a major struggle when it comes to Christianity. We know there's such a rebellion, such a pushback on Christianity. Today, Malta and its people, 98% of them are born again, saved Christians. So don't tell me that God will waste any shipwreck. God will use it all. He'll, he'll use it all then. When you think about that, and of course the guys, the guys that were the doubters ended up becoming believers. And that's how my God works. So don't worry about what type of voyage you're in. Don't stress over what type of storm you're facing. You always have a but God in your story. Bow your head, close your eyes. Father, we thank you. Thank you so much for today. We thank you that your love is so unconditional. Lord, I thank you that you have a divine 
purpose and plan for every single person here. And if you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with God, I didn't say religion, I said relationship. There's too much religion out there, but religion brings you back to bondage. Jesus wants to know you personally, intimately. Jesus loves you. He died for you on the cross. He paid for your sins. The only way to heaven is through the Son. If you don't believe that, read the Bible. I mean, just look at our society. The number one best-selling book still on planet Earth is the Holy Bible. 2,000 years later, the Word of God cannot be stopped. So I'm here to tell you that Jesus wants to be your friend. Jesus wants to save you. Jesus wants to rescue you from your wreckage. Jesus wants to redeem your life. Jesus wants to give you a future with hope. As a matter of fact, when you die, which every single one of us here on this, on this earth will die one day, you and I can experience eternity in a place called heaven. Yes, there is a hell, but heaven is greater than hell. God did not create hell for any human being. God created heaven for all his kids, and you're his kid. People choose that voyage. God doesn't send people there. God's final destination was eternity with him. So if you're here and you've never done that before, you've never invited Christ into your heart, you've never said, Jesus, be my Lord and Savior. Be the captain of my destination. Be the Lord of my life. You can do that today. Every single weekend, people here give their life to Christ. When I count to three, your hand will go up high in the air, and then you can put it right back down after you raise it up. Why do I need you to lift your hand? You know why? Because if you're ashamed inside a safe building like this where we believe in God, you're going to be ashamed when you leave these doors. You'll always be afraid to say, I'm a Christian. So today, you have an opportunity to say, yes, Jesus, save me. I need you. I want you to be my Savior. And then I'll lead us all in, in this amazing prayer. The Bible says, if you, if you believe me with your heart and you confess me with your mouth, he says, I'll save you. God wants to hear you say it, and I want to lead you through that prayer. At the count of three, one, you're not afraid. Two, you're not going to be ashamed. Three, he loves you. Ready? If that's you, lift your hand. One, two, three. Hands up. Anyone here at all, you're saying, I want Christ in my life. I see those hands. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? That's so cool. I love that. Okay. If you didn't lift your hand and you've been nervous, like, oh, my God, what are people going to think? Who gives a rip? You lift your hand and you say, Jesus, save me. I'm going to give you one more opportunity. If you did not lift your hand, you can do that right now. Ready? One, two, three. If that's you, lift your hand high in the air. Anyone else? I see that. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right, let's all pray this together. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Forgive me of all my sins, every one of them. Today, it's a new day. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on me and for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Awesome. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.